Hello, and welcome to the eighth part of the Ancient Roman Iceberg. If you haven't seen the previous parts, I would definitely recommend you go check those out, as they cover some things we're going to get deeper into in this episode. Anyway, let's get into the video. We start today in our ninth tier. Alba Longa was an important Latin city located in the Alban Hills. The Romans tell us that the city was the founder and leader of the Latin League. The city was said to be founded by Anchises, a son of the legendary Aeneas. The city's royal line would eventually result in the births of Romulus and Remus, thus the city was often looked at as a sort of primogenitor of the early city of Rome. Livy further tells us that several important Roman families, including the Julia and the Servilia, were all originally from the city of Alba Longa. According to Roman tradition, the city was the leader of the Latin League, and the most powerful Latin city during the rule of the first few Roman kings. Tullius Hostilius, Rome's third king, would go to war with the Albans. This war, described by Livy as a sort of civil war, would eventually result in a duel to the death among two sets of three brothers, the Curati and the Hurati. We aren't quite sure which side represented which, but Livy prefers the view that the Hurati were Romans while the Curati were Albans. This duel was done to avoid large-scale bloodshed, as both sides recognized that if the Latins sufficiently weakened themselves, the Etruscans or another Italic group could pounce on that weakness and conquer or subjugate the Latins and the Romans. In the end, the Roman set of brothers won the duel, and the Albans became a sort of vassal state to Rome. A short time after the conflict, Vey, Rome's eternal enemy, would attack the Roman state. As per the treaty, Rome called upon Alba Longa to help repel the attack. At first, it seemed that the Albans would indeed help their Roman brethren. However, the dictator of Alba Longa, a man named Medius Furius, had secretly made a pact with Vey, and when the battle began, Medius led his troops away, leaving the Romans alone. However, Rome managed to win the battle, and Tullius executed Medius. Following this betrayal, Tullius ordered the city of Alba Longa destroyed, with only the temples left standing. The population of the city was forcibly moved to Rome, more specifically, the Caelian Hill. Tullius allowed the leading families of Alba Longa to become patricians, and inducted them into the Senate. And really, that's about all we hear of Alba Longa in traditional Roman stories. Our modern archaeology does paint a bit of a different picture. It had been long debated if the city actually existed, as Quite simply, even by the time of the Republic, the exact location of the city had been lost to history. With modern techniques, we have been able to extensively search the Alban Hills for any evidence of cities the size of what Alba Longa was, and so far we've found nothing. We have found that there were a string of villages in the Alban Hills. These villages date from around 900 to 700 BCE, right in line to have been conquered or destroyed by the Roman Kingdom. Interestingly, it seems as though the Alban Hills were actually a religiously important site for the Latins, and by extension Rome, that was, shall we say, embellished by Roman authors. For instance, we know that every year a large festival was held on Mount Albano, modern-day Mount Calvo. The mountain is the second highest mountain in the Alban Hills, and is the remains of an old volcano. This festival was held in honor of Jupiter, and the temple built on the mountain was one of, if not the most important pilgrimages a Latin could make. Further, we are also fairly certain that the worship of Vestia may very well have come from the Alban Hills in some way. Lavinium, the mother city of Alba Longa, is the city with the oldest evidence of worship of Vesta, and was, even into the Republic, oftentimes the site of pilgrimages by the Roman elite to sacrifice offerings to the goddess, and other household gods as well. So the history of the city is a bit of a mixed bag. According to the traditional Roman view, the city was one of the most important Latin cities, and was frankly the mother city of Rome. But archaeological evidence seems to counter that narrative. In any case, Alba Longa, or maybe just the Alban Hills, were extremely important and influential cultural sites that had a large part in shaping early Roman society. This is a bit of a repeat, and not something I'll get too deep into. However, this refers to a surprisingly popular theory or conspiracy that Rome was somehow fake. I did a bit of a deeper dive into this into a previous episode, which I will link in the upper right hand corner and in the description, but yes, Rome, the Kingdom, the Republic, and the Empire were all indeed real. The Sertorian War was a civil war fought between 80 and 72 BCE between two factions, the Sertorians and the Solans. The Sertorians were led by a Roman general, 
named Quintus Sertorius, while the Solans were led by everyone's favorite pre-Caesarian dictator, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. The war was sort of a continuation of the admittedly much more famous civil war between Sulla and Gaius Marius. Quintus Sertorius had been a supporter of Gaius Marius, and had actually served under the man himself during the war against Sulla. However, he had a sort of falling out with Gaius Marius the Younger, the son of Gaius Marius. The younger Gaius had been appointed consul despite not being old enough and not having held any other offices. This was done by Gnaeus Papyrus Caurbo, the new leader of the Marians after both Gaius Marius the Elder and Lucius Cornelius Cinna, the original leaders of the faction, had died. Carbo hoped to drum up support by hearkening back to the original leaders of the faction. This actually did work, and many of the veterans of the previous conflicts flocked to the banner of the younger Gaius Marius. However, Sertorius felt slighted, as he was a much more qualified choice. Not only had he supported the Marians since the beginning of the conflict, but he had followed the Cursus Honorum. Carbo, though, did not see it that way, and ordered Sertorius to journey to Hispania, where he would become the propraetor of the province. Sertorius had some sort of army at his back and managed to actually gain control of both Hispania Ulterior and Hispania Citerior from Gaius Valerius Flaccus, the previously appointed governor of both provinces. Sadly though for Sertorius, back in Italy Sulla won the ensuing civil war and set out to mop up any Marian resistance. Sertorius attempted to fortify the passes in the Pyrenees, but before he was able to, Sulla arrived with a much larger army. and with the help of a betrayal by a leading officer in Sertorius' army, managed to break through his blockades. Sertorius attempted to convince the Spanish tribes to fight for him, but was ultimately unsuccessful. With no other options, he abandoned Hispania, and with a group of about 3,000 or so men, fled into Mauritania, modern-day Morocco. He would eventually join up with a gang of pirates, which, yeah, that's a pretty serious fall from grace. These pirates, though, as pirates typically do, eventually moved on and helped to install a man named Aeneas Luscus, who was a supporter of Sulla, as king of Tangier, an important city in Mauritania that controlled the African side of the Strait of Gibraltar. Sertorius followed them into Tangier, but recognized that the locals were unhappy with Luscus, who was viewed as a bit of a tyrant. Capitalizing on this, Sertorius led a local rebellion that deposed Luscus. By this point, Sertorius was starting to make a bit of a name for himself and those back in Hispania were beginning to rethink their support for him. This boiled over when in 80 BCE, the Lusitanians, a local Spanish tribe, asked Sertorius to lead them in war against the Sullian governor of Hispania. We aren't quite sure what caused this act of rebellion, but it was likely over the amount of tribute that the Lusitanians needed to pay to the Romans, or some other similar issue. Sertorius led his remaining men across the strait, and landed at Baleo Claudia, a town right beside the famous Pillars of Hercules. Here he began to gather the Lusitanians and the local Spanish tribes into his army. He fought a battle at the Baides River, which we know next to nothing about the specifics, but we do know this marked the beginning of the Sertorian War. This battle allowed Sertorius to establish control over most of Hispania Ulterior, while the Solon forces fell back to Hispania Citerior. At this point, Sulla and the Senate back in Rome heard about the situation, and decided to send reinforcements. These reinforcements were led by a man named Quintus Cassilius Metellius Pius, the consular partner of Sulla. In the meantime, Lucius Hertilius, the second in command for Sertorius, began his push into Hispania Citerior. Marcus Dominius Calvinus led the Sullian response. The two armies met at Consibura, modern day Consigira. Again, the details are a little light, but we know that Hertilius, likely bolstered by the fact that his army was mostly made up of locals, used guerrilla warfare to hound Calvinus all the way to the Anas River. Here, Calvinus was either killed in battle or killed by his own troops, but in any case the remaining Romans defected to Sertorius, and most of Hispania was now his for the taking. At this point, Metellius Pius finally landed in Hispania. This time, Sertorius himself came out into the field of battle. Sertorius continued in Hertilius' footsteps, and relied on the knowledge of his local warriors to conduct devastating hit-and-run and other guerrilla tactics on Metellius and his army. Metellius tried to ignore the attacks, and went about securing the loyalty of the remaining local tribes. Eventually, though, he was forced to recognize that the situation was spiraling out of control, and he was forced to call for further aid from Rome. Lucius Manilus, the governor of neighboring Transalpine Gaul, attempted to come to his aid, 
but was defeated by Hertilius and was eventually forced to return to Gaul due to an attack by the Aquitani. In 78, two disasters struck Matilius. Firstly, he attempted to lay siege to Langobergia, a town that allied to Sertorius. He did this in the hopes of showing the tribes of Hispania that Sertorius was unable to defend them, and that even with his victories in the field, he would not triumph over Rome. Sertorius, though, had some sort of informants inside Matilius' army, and was forewarned of the upcoming siege. He quickly fortified the city, and stockpiled all the food in the surrounding countryside within the city walls. Matilius was unprepared for this. He had expected to be able to raid the surrounding area, and use the supplies gained from raiding to feed his men. With no hope of feeding his men, Matilius was forced to give up the siege, and retreated back to the coastline. The second disaster was that back in Rome, good old Sola finally died. The Solian faction was instantly thrown into chaos. There was no clear leader, and while the men back in Rome fought to decide who would step into Sola's shoes, Matilius was left to his own devices. No help would be coming for at least the next year, and Matilius was forced to take up defensive positions near the Baetes River. Luckily for him though, Sertorius, either not seeing the golden opportunity before him, or simply being forced to, focused on subduing the remaining Spanish tribes. This distraction allowed Matilius to survive until 76 BCE. Back in Rome, the Senate finally recognized that something serious needed to be done to put this rebellion down. They appointed Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, better known as Pompey, as the new proconsular governor of Hispania Ceterior. Pompey was given a sizable army, made up of roughly 30,000 infantry and about 1,000 cavalry, and given basically free reign to put down the rebellion. In the meantime, Sertorius received his own reinforcement in the form of Marcus Perpinia, who led the remaining army of Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, another rebel against Sulla. Pompey first started along the coast, with the goal of linking up with Metellius, who was still stranded further inland. The two armies met at Larium. Pompey was overconfident. He believed that his numerical superiority would win the day, and thus rushed in his preparations to give battle. Sertorius hounded Pompey's foraging parties. With each attack, the party strayed further and further from the two camps. Eventually, the parties were far enough away that they could be comfortably attacked without alerting the main camp. This was what Sertorius had been waiting for. He sent his most well-equipped troops to attack the foraging parties. It was a massacre, and an embarrassing defeat for Pompey, who was now forced to flee. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for Sertorius, though, as at around the same time, Metellius made a move of his own, and managed to defeat the army meant to hold him in place. Capitalizing on this, Metellius managed to make his way to Pompey, and the two armies united together. I can't get too deep into the remaining action during the war, as frankly it deserves its own video, but the two sides continued to fight, and the balance of power swung back and forth several times over the next two years. Eventually, in 74 BCE, Pompey wrote to the Senate. These letters, preserved by Sallust, are actually quite fascinating, and I'll leave a link in the description to their full contents, but he essentially tells the Senate to either send him more troops and more supplies, or he will take matters into his own hands. He literally ends the letters with this quote. So, I'm out of options, money and credit. It is up to you, either you save the situation, or my army will come to Italy and bring the war with it. It's not what I want, but you have been warned. This frightened the hell out of Rome's elite, and they apparently funded the response themselves. Not only did Pompey receive reinforcement and new supplies, but a bounty was even offered by Metilius. Any Roman who would betray Sertorius was to be given 100 silver talents and 20,000 acres of land. Quite the reward. Rather quickly, Sertorius became quite paranoid, and began to shut his Romans out of decision making. He even appointed local Spanish troops as his own bodyguards, replacing the Romans who had held the post previously. This all caused the Romans under him to begin to waver, and Plutarch tells us that they began to plot his downfall. The Romans also took this out on the local Spanish troops, with punishments and general treatment of the local troops becoming harsher and harsher. It's at this point we are told that Sertorius began to break down. He had become a paranoid, erratic mess, who could no longer be trusted to throw a party, much less lead an army. So, Propernia, that general from earlier, invited Sertorius to a party, which he claimed was to celebrate the upcoming victory that they were sure to achieve. However, this was all just a ruse, and Propernia, along with a few other Romans, assassinated Sertorius. At this point, the entire rebellion began to break down. 
Several local tribes either sued for peace with Pompey or just simply went home. Some of the Romans that remained attempted to carry on the rebellion under Perpernia, but were quickly destroyed by Pompey. In the end, Pompey would execute Perpernia and all the men that had murdered Sertorius. The local tribes would resume their alliance and tribute with Rome, and Pompey would continue his meteoric rise in Roman political life. This war was really the end of the Sullian Wars, and represented the last breath of the Marian faction. The Palmyrene Empire was a breakaway state formed in 260, during the infamous Crisis of the Third Century. The empire first started when Odonathus, the ruler of the city of Palmyra, was declared king by the local population in 260. This was after Shapur I had managed to attack the empire, and actually captured the Emperor Valerian. Odonathus was nominally loyal to Galenius, the son of Valerian, but in actuality ruled as basically an independent king. Odonathus managed to push back Shapur, and was given the title Governor of the East in recognition of this feat. However, Odonathus proclaimed himself King of Kings, and was seemingly set to rule as an independent ruler. However, he was assassinated along with his son, Herarion, in 267. He was succeeded by his youngest son, Vavavalis, who was only 10 years old at the time. Vavavalis's mother, Zenobia, would be declared regent. Zenobia would work to solidify her hold on power over the next few years. Finally, in 270, she threw off the veil of loyalty and marched on Basra, an important local Roman city and home to the Roman governor of Arabia Petria. She continued the march south and invaded Egypt with an army of 70,000. She quickly conquered the province and was declared Queen of Egypt. The Roman general, Tenegano Probus, attempted to fend off the invasion, and even managed to regain Alexandria after its conquest by Zenobia, but eventually he was besieged in Babylon, where he committed suicide after being captured by Zenobia. After this, Zenobia turned her attention northward and invaded Asia Minor, conquering as far as modern-day Ankara. In 271, Vavavalis and Zenobia both assumed the title of Augustus, and were seemingly set to control the eastern half of the empire. Sadly for Zenobia and her son, the Emperor Aurelian had come to power, and managed to calm the various crises that the empire had been torn apart by. He invaded through the Bosphorus, and conquered city after city. Aurelian would defeat Zenobia at the Battle of Ime, and then at the Battle of Emesa. Finally, in the summer of 272, at the city of Palmyra itself, Zenobia was besieged. Zenobia was defiant and refused to surrender. Palmyra, though, was a fortress, and Aurelian and his Romans failed again and again to take the city. Eventually, Zenobia was forced to take drastic actions. She fled the city under nightfall and headed to the east to ask Shapur and the Persians for help. But before she could make it, she was captured by Aurelian's forces. She was brought back to the emperor and the sight of Zenobia in chains convinced the city to capitulate. Most of the high-ranking officers and leaders of Palmyra were executed, but the fate of Zenobia and her son are left vague. We are unsure if they were likewise executed or sent into some form of exile. Whatever the case, the short-lived empire was reabsorbed into the Roman Empire. Today, we mostly focus on the city of Palmyra itself, which still stands as one of the best-preserved Roman cities of the period. The empire which centered itself on the city represents a trying time in Roman history, a time where the empire very nearly fell apart. If it hadn't been for Aurelian's genius, the Palmyrene Empire may very well have become an important player in a post-Roman world. The Great Fire of Rome is a fairly popular historical event. The fire itself took place on the 18th of June in the year 64. It began near the Circus Maximus, but would quickly spread to somewhere around 70% of the city. At the time, Rome was split into 14 districts. Three were completely decimated by the fire, a further seven were in various states of destruction, while the other four managed to stay safe from the blaze. Some of Rome's most important buildings, including the House of the Vestal Virgins, Nero's Palace, Temple of Jupiter Sator, and much of the Forum were all completely destroyed. The fire has been subject to quite a bit of speculation throughout history. However, before I get into some of the speculation, let me just say that the cause of the fire was almost certainly an accidental fire near the shops around the Circus Maximus. That blaze was exacerbated by a strong wind that came during the night that blew embers all across the city. 
Remember that at the time, much of Rome was not the great temples of marble or stone that we think of today. It was instead a maze of tightly packed wooden buildings. These buildings proved to be easy kindling for the fire. The fire burned continuously for six days before dying down and then reigniting for a further three. Now, let's quickly talk about the speculation and conspiracies around the fire. Nero, who was emperor at the time, is one of Rome's worst and most insane emperors. He was tyrannical, corrupt, and impulsive. That being said, he was also not in the city of Rome when the fire occurred. In fact, Nero actually quickly returned to the city upon being informed of the fire and facilitated food shipments and opened public buildings to house those who had lost their homes in the fire. He also started a fairly decent rebuilding plan in the aftermath of the fire. His urban plan is actually still visible in the city today. However, Nero was so unpopular that many Roman authors, and even Romans at the time, spread and recorded various rumors about the fire and Nero's involvement, or lack thereof. Most of these rumors center around Nero starting the fire, and then either singing or playing the lyre while the city burned. Typically, some sort of aspiration to rebuild the city in his image is included to give some sort of motive to his actions. But really, the truth is that Rome was basically destined to burn. In just the few decades previous, no less than six different fires had occurred in the city, with one starting in 36 in the exact same area that the Great Fire would start in. My point is that Rome at this point in time was not a well-planned city. It was an overcrowded, poorly built and poorly maintained city. It was not a matter of if a fire would start, but a matter of when, and it just so happened that Nero was the emperor when the Great Fire started. This isn't to say that Nero wasn't a terrible ruler, he certainly was, but in this case, the Great Fire of Rome was not caused by his incompetence, instead, it was caused by centuries of mismanagement and short-sightedness. The foreign gods of Rome refer to the fascinating practice in Roman history of adopting local and foreign gods into the Roman state religion. To give just a few examples, the god Mithra was likely adopted from Persian religion, Vesta was adopted from Lavinium, Cybele was adopted from Anatolia, and Epona was adopted from the Celts. These gods and goddesses were typically adopted in one of two ways. The first and oldest method was through Ivacasha. In this ritual, the Roman consul or some other high-ranking official would journey to a conquered city where they would beseech and welcome the main deity of the city to follow them back to Rome. Typically, this would involve carrying the statues and other ceremonial goods of the god or goddess back to Rome, where they would be placed in a new temple. This method was much more common in the early history of Rome, especially during the conquest of the various Italic tribes. The second method by which these gods could be brought into Roman religion was essentially cultural assimilation. The Romans were actually fairly open to other religions. Oftentimes, the Romans would associate local deities with their own. For instance, Solus was a Celtic goddess of healing and water. The Romans associated her with Minerva, and a local cult called the cult of Solus Minerva was established and flourished around the area of modern-day Bath in England. Sometimes, such as in the cases of Cybele, these gods and goddesses would be accepted almost in there entirely. There were outliers, of course, most famously the Druids, but on the whole, we actually see the Romans adopt quite a few local deities into the Roman religion, albeit as a sort of aspect of a native Roman deity. And that is where we will pause our examination for today. I hope to have piqued your interest into some new aspect of Roman history. Join me next time as we continue to dig deeper into the depths of Roman history. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. Definitely let me know if any of these topics in particular has struck your fancy, and I may add it to the list to cover more in depth in the future. I again apologize for the inconsistency lately. It just seems like every time I get some time to record, something else comes up or I lose all motivation. I am doing much better now though, and this video should be the start of a return to regular uploading. Again, my apologies, but hopefully you can all forgive me. We have just one more video on the iceberg before we return to our more structured videos. That video should come out on Friday. The 15th of March. The video should come out Saturday the 16th of March. I hope you all are excited to see that. If you have any comments or questions on the video or believe I've made a mistake, please comment down below and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed. It really helps the channel out. Peace.